Let me again take you to the end of that discussion number two, as we were on page four. As we get in some ways to what I hope is the, the reason that I at least want to go through all of this. My fear at times when we talk about the methodology of Christ-centered preaching and begin to look at all of Scripture as a redemptive historical message <laughs> is that what we'll do is we'll create a check-off system for preaching now. Oh, you did the right thing. Or you follow this system or that system. Now, you know, now you've got some other thing to have to think about. I confess that's not my prime motivation. My prime motivation is not to sell you on a method. It's just to remind you of grace. And it is to have you preach grace. To recognize that fundamentally it is all we have as Christian preachers. Why else would we bother? What else are we about? But the message of the grace that's available in Christ Jesus. And it's not just to talk about the hope of grace, it's to recognize the power of it. It just sounds kind of swarmy and maudlin to say, you know, there's nothing more powerful than love. But the fact of the matter is that's what we believe as Christians. There is nothing more powerful than responding to the love that God has for us out of love. There is nothing more powerful in terms of compulsion of our own holiness our desire to see the lost one to Jesus, our own desire to worship Him and put our lives before Him, it's all fundamentally based on the message of His grace is so great, I love Him so. And that's what I want my preaching to be about. And it's why I have to say, I just don't want to impose that on the text. I want to see how the text is saying that. So that when I am preaching, I'm not telling people of their own self-efforts or trying to motivate them out of the guilt that God wants to relieve them of. I'm wanting to, to let them understand the fullness of grace, which will be the power of God in their lives. So if we begin now on this idea, if I've begun to look at passages for what is it revealing about the nature of God providing redemption, or the nature of man requiring redemption, and I'm trying to think from that passage, how is someone to respond to that? I think there are basic messages that start to typify Christ-centered preaching. These are not the only messages. They are definitely not Sola Bootstrapsa or the Deadly Bees. But these things begin to typify in a thousand different ways what we begin to preach as Christ-centered preachers. Number one, God's grace despite our sin. The messages of assurance and adoption. That our comfort is in God's love for us. The whole concept, and here now the biblical theological theme starts to take over, the whole concept of the Christian Sabbath. That we rest in Him, not in our works. We rest in what He has done for us. And so we, we understand that, that while there was the Sabbath of creation, when Israel was delivered, they were going to Canaan, identified as Sabbath land. They were going to the land of God's rest. We learn that as Christians in Hebrews 4, that, that we now enter Christ's Sabbath. We've rested from our works to build our way up to God, but we rest in what Christ has done. And ultimately, when we are complete in Him, what heaven itself is called is our Sabbath. So our comfort is in His provision, His love for us is a definite message. Despite our sin, He has loved us so. It's also part of our confidence in God's love that, that God has extended His grace toward us despite our sin. He is abiding faithful, though we are faithless. Why? Because we are robed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. God looks at us and sees His own Son. Some of you know the work of Jack Miller and his whole sonship emphasis. He says you can't live the Christian life until you first get sonship straight. Because otherwise you'll try to live to be a son rather than living out the notion that you are God's child. He has made you his own by his work and that, was, that is the thing that gives you the joy that is your strength. You can't really live the Christian life in the despair that God's never going to love you because you can't ever do enough to make him happy. It's the confidence of His love that gives you the strength to do His will. So we serve God because we're well-rested. 
And we serve God out of the confidence that we are not somehow going to drift out of His favor by some awful thing. We are resting in Him and His love of us. Also a typical message of Christ in preaching is grace destroying the guilt of sin. Messages of justification and forgiveness. And the typical topics should be things like our need for repentance. We see that there are requirements that God has placed in His Word that we do not meet, and therefore it is necessary for us to repent. We see here now the, the nature of man that requires redemption. We are the people who require repentance. Messages of God's cleansing, what He does provide, His grace destroying the guilt of our sin. But also messages of grace defeating the power of sin. Messages of sanctification and enablement, that He has given us victory over the world the flesh, and the devil. That we are new creatures in Christ Jesus. We are fundamentally changed beings by His grace so that we are now able to live the Christian life. And that continues because of His provision of the Holy Spirit and the Word. And apart from those things, we can do nothing. And ultimately, the message of grace compelling holiness. Not grace securing holiness. Grace compelling holiness the messages of worship and obedience, that because of God's grace, we now give Him thanksgiving and praise and gratitude. And far from being an antinomian message, because of grace, we can now you know, just go do whatever you want. It's the message, rather, of loving service, that because of His love for us, we respond in love to Him. And that is what right obedience is. You see the note at the bottom of page 4. It is this last topic the topic of loving service that is often the telltale sign of Christ-centered preaching. Historically, concerns for obedience cause the most debate when you get into this redemptive historical methodology. Because it is difficult to remove obedience as a qualification for grace without having some question whether you have removed obedience as a requirement for life. Consistently preaching the necessity and the proper motivation for holiness may be the most difficult task evangelical preachers face. To just preach obedience is not hard. To just preach love is not hard. But to preach these things together, the necessity and proper motivation for obedience is probably the hardest task that we face day in and day out in the pulpit. So as we move to discussion number three, that's, that's my goal, to understand how christ in the preaching affects the Christian life as well as biblical exposition. How do we, if we feel the need of stimulating holiness, of calling God's people to obedience, how do we stimulate holiness through christ in the preaching? And that leads to another basic question, which is, what makes people more holy? What makes redeemed people particularly more holy. Threat of condemnation or promise of grace? It is not a new question. What will make them more holy? Threat of condemnation or promise of grace, as a quick study of Romans 6.1 will tell you. Sometimes people say, uh, if you're not being accused of being an antinomian, you are not preaching grace. And uh, we know that from Paul. Huh? Now, Paul was not antinomian, but he was sure accused of it. And we ought to question, if, if, if all we are hearing is, uh, Pastor, you sure stepped on my toes today. Man, you did a great job. You made me feel awful. I'm not saying that necessarily is all revealing, but it may be something of a revelation. Have we done all that the Bible is requiring us to do? The question is debated in every generation of believers. I just cite for you here the example of John Bunyan while he was in prison wonderful account of while he was facing death, debating with other believers while they were in prison whether assurance of God's love promoted holiness or license. If you just tell people that they can be assured of God's love for them, does that make them more licentious or does it make them more holy? Bunyan said, by the way, if you kept assuring people of God's love, it would make them more holy. The concern with the idea of assured grace is similar to that surrounding any doctrine of perseverance. If we tell people they do not have to worry about rejection, what's to keep them on the straight and narrow? Some people reason we can't tell them God will never reject them or they'll just do what they want. 
Once saved, always saved, is equated with have perseverance, will party. <laughs> the same reasoning asks, what reason will God's people have to be holy if all you do is keep assuring them of grace? So I ask you again, as you're talking to the redeemed people of God, what better leads to true holiness, threat of punishment, or promise of grace? Now there's an important caveat with the term punishment. I didn't say discipline, right? Who took our penalty entirely? Christ. Okay, so I'm not talking about threat of discipline, but I am talking about threat of punishment, of a, of a punitive God. Will that keep people more in line? Or the promise of a gracious God? Well, if you ask that question, what do, again, various standards say? I come from Westminster background, so forgive me as I cite it here. But these are historic confessions, which sometimes our own current and contemporary preachers have lost sight of. The confession says of Westminster, the liberty which God, through Christ, has purchased for believers under the gospel consists in their freedom from the guilt of sin the condemning wrath of God, the curse of the moral law, and they're being delivered from the dominion of sin. But notice these last. And also their free access to God, their yielding obedience to Him, not out of slavish fear, but a childlike love and willing mind. Our, our liberty in Christ is the liberty to serve God not out of slavish fear, but a childlike love and willing mind. Go down a couple of paragraphs. The Spirit of Christ subdues and enables the will of man to do that freely and cheerfully, which is the will of God. Now, I want you to recognize the necessity of these terms for the proper Christian walk. If we are doing things not out of joy, gratitude, Willingness, but instead are doing them out of slavish fear. If I don't do this, the ogre in the sky is going to get me. Or if I do it, I'll get a bigger mansion one day. Or in certain theologies, two days. If those latter reasons are the cause for my obedience, I avoid punishment, or I get more things, then what is the motivation for my obedience? Me. Selfishness. You see, if, if grace is not proper motivation, if grace is not the reason for the obedience, then the only reason we are serving God is either out of self-protection or self-promotion, which is selfishness. So if I am not serving God out of love for Him, then what I'm doing, even though it may be proper in terms of the commandments, is not holy at all. Far from earning me nothing, it is actually, again, antithetical to the gospel and to the Christian life. What does the Bible say, after all? How are we to be motivated in the Christian life? The love of God constrains us, even in that ministry of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5 and following, you know. Romans 8.15, you have not received the spirit again to fear, but you have received the spirit of sonship, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. 1 John 4.18, there's no fear in love, perfect love cast out fear, because fear hath torment. Even Luke 1, in the narrative, in the um, nativity accounts, he has come and redeemed his people to enable us to serve him without fear. And I take these words, fear, to be in the wrong sense. That fear which is just kind of self-protection of a wrath of a God that's not in the Bible. Apparently, our holiness is not to be a result to responding to threats. Again, it would just be self-protection. If it was anyway, it wouldn't be holiness. One of the critical thinkers in this area is Ritterboss, and some of you have read this work <laughs> describing Paul and outline his theology. He says this in respect to Colossians 3. Where in response he says, to for you have died and your life is hid in Christ, the command at once resounds. Put to death, therefore, the members of your body uh, upon the earth, fornication, plainness, etc. Having once died with Christ does not render superfluous putting to death the members that on earth. But it's precisely the great urgent reason for it. And what he's saying is we have died with Christ. Okay, so the, the, 
The justification work has occurred. And as a result of the justification work, our identity now in Christ's death, we're identified with him, obedience results. But now the key terms follow. The imperative, what we have to do, is thus founded on the indicative. It is immediately clear that the imperative rests on the indicative and that this order is not reversible. It's not because we obey that we're in Christ Jesus. No, it's the indicative. We are in Christ Jesus. Therefore, we obey. We even can obey because of that. We could have no obedience were it not for the grace in which we are found and held, identified. There could be an obedience apart from that. Our service would only be selfishness. Therefore, what I'm trying to say for us as believers and parents and pastors, the rules don't change when we do Christ-centered preaching. The reasons do. I, you know, I don't say... Now it's okay to steal. The, the, the rules are still the same. But I'm not saying don't steal because, you know, either God will love you or God will reject you as a result of your action. I'm saying because you are a Christian. Don't steal. It's, it's because of the, the standing that you have in Christ. I, I, I try to say it to my children. I, you know, I how does it integrate into daily life? <laughs> I try to keep myself from saying to my children because of something they did, you're a bad child. I, I, I say to my children sometimes, no, no, don't do that. You know better than that. Be what you, be what you are. You are a child of God. You are in Christ. Be what you are. You know what you are. Be that way. And I think it's important for us to learn that terminology and that philosophy for Christians. To, to look at somebody who is despairing of their sin or rebellious and to say to them, I cannot assure you if you were living a consistently rebellious lifestyle that you're in Christ Jesus. That's not the point. But to say to people who are depressed about their sin, who are, who are not finding the strength of their salvation, to say, listen, you need to be what you are. Remember, you are in Christ Jesus. Remember, he has covered you with his righteousness. It's not by your work that you're getting to God. And if you just keep trying to wrestle and wrestle and make this right with God, you're just going to despair. You'll never make it right with God. But remember something. He has loved you. He has provided his son for you. It's his work that makes you right with him. And it's, it's that perception of the righteousness of Christ that he has provided with the blood of his own son that's... That's the trigger, the motivation for the right Christian life. It is not somehow running away from the ogre in the sky who's going to get me that makes me more holy. What makes me more holy is gazing consistently upon the cross of Jesus Christ and saying, He loves me so, and if I have been in, a, in, in rebellion, if my people have been in rebellion, what do I do? I say, look at the cross. Look at what all the scripture is revealing about his love for you. Look at how all the Bible is revealing his wonderful grace for you, toward you. His, his faithful love, despite your faithlessness. Look at it. Let it take you and take hold of you. And it's when, when grace dominates that the true power of Christian living takes hold. Now, of course, people can work that and say, oh, all my preacher does is talk about grace so I can do whatever I want. But then the grace doesn't apply to them, you see. I mean, it, 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 they're not living out of the promises of God. But if what we are doing is consistently in our message taking what is the core of the Christian gospel and saying, look at Jesus, there is nothing more powerful. I said it sounds kind of swarmy, and dumb, but I want you to hear me say it. There is no more powerful force on this earth than love for Jesus Christ. And if people have been taught deeply and consistently of his love for them, they will love him, and that will make them more holy than anything else we can do. There is nothing more powerful than love. Why then is there the debate over whether we should threaten with guilt or correct with love? Well, you know, my preachers, we feel the need for a corrective. We wonder how we shall compel others, or even ourselves, 
who are sinful to stop sinning, the most obvious and often the most efficient method, at least in the short term, is to threaten rejection, retribution, or introduce doubt about one's salvation. Such comments can be very effective in changing people's behavior. But are such comments proper? And if so, what are the proper limits? Ultimately, the question boils down to what we believe is the relationship between our conduct and God's acceptance. Are we holy for God's acceptance? Or are we holy from God's acceptance? Am I, am I cranking out the good works so I'll get God's acceptance, at which I know that God's acceptance is never accessible, if I really understand the holiness of God? So I go to despair. Or more sin. Or pride. Pretend I've done it. I've done it. Or are we holy from acceptance? I know there's nothing I can do that can make me right with God. And it's out of the knowledge that He has loved me and given His own Son for me. It's out of the knowledge that He called me out of works not my own. That now, that now I'm able to serve Him without that which leads either to despair or to pride. Humility before God. It's nothing in me. It's what He's done for me that leads to true holiness. And humility only comes as I understand my standing is entirely on the basis of His grace and not my gain. I learned this so much more as a pastor than I did, I confess, as a theology student. And some of the passion I feel for this message is, is a direct result of what I felt was some degree of failure in the first five years of pastoral experience. In which I went into a pulpit and I think I regularly preached what I thought was a biblical message. I mean, I, right out of the Bible it said, be faithful to your spouse, and don't steal, and be a good parent. I, you know, I said all of those things. But I began to hear something more candidly in my counseling than I did in my preaching. I would, for instance, deal with a couple who might be in, in, involved in some degree of, of immorality. And, and I would say to that couple, now listen, you're experiencing all kinds of hardship in your life and, and so forth. And if you really expect to have the love of God in your life, what you've got to do is you've got to change your behavior. And when you change your behavior, then you'll have the, the love of God. Uh, in a certain sense, and, and I would see some behavior change. What, what struck me as so debilitating was I would look at these people two years, three years, four years down the road. And while they might not be in that behavior that they had been in when I started counseling them, they would often be in some other sort of compulsive behavior or else in deep despair. And I think you recognize why. Listen, if people are trusting in their behavior change to get approval with God, in whom are they trusting to take their sin away? Themselves. See, what I had done is I had, as this wonderful preacher of Reformed theology, I had introduced works into the equation of a person's relationship with God. And, and as a result, these people were in a certain sense further from God than when they started my wonderful counseling. Because I was teaching them, it was just depending on what they did, how much love of God they got. I had to teach something else, and I would try this formula for holiness just to say it to you. This is page three. If in order to become acceptable to God and avoid or abrogate our guilt, we must correct our behavior, then our spiritual lives reflect this formula. If we have guilt that is canceled by behavior change, that's just one clear thing in Scripture. That's Pharisees. If we think our guilt is canceled by our behavior change. But if acceptance precedes and motivates holiness, our spiritual lives will reflect this formula. We, we have guilt that hopefully sound preaching reveals that we are guilty before God. We are a sinful or rebellious people and we're not ashamed to say it. Good preaching reveals it. It convicts of wrong and of sin. But then we speak about that guilt and what cancels it. And it's not behavior change. It's the work of Christ at the cross. Which once rightly perceived causes grateful behavior change. It's 
It's a gratitude response now. Now I'm trying to get God's approval. I'm responding in gratitude to what He has done. And out of gratitude, I change behavior. And that is true repentance. Because it is deep humility. Nothing I could have done would have made this right with God. I go to the cross and lay it down. And then in gratitude, seek Him with new holiness, with new obedience. But I recognize it's not my obedience that made it right. So that when I have sinned, and come on, we are all in seminary environments. I, my brain does it too. Yours does too. I've done something I, I knew was wrong. And so I'm going to go to chapel three times this week. And I'm really going to get in strength with God. I'm going to extend my quiet time. I'm going to read my Bible more. Now listen, that is the most natural human response. It's not the Christian response. Now I'm not saying don't read your Bibles. <laughs> but what I am saying is that's not what fixes it. Ultimately, I have to be a parent who will, will look at a daughter who was saying, Mom and Dad, will you please get off my back? Don't you know I know what I did was wrong? Will you please just let me alone so I can fix it? And I want to be able to say, but listen, honey, that's what I want you to know. You can't fix it. And, and, and you'll do this again in your life until you recognize you can't fix it. But Jesus died for it. And when you recognize fully how much he loved you to do that, then you see that's when the grace of God becomes power. That you'll love him so much you won't want to do that again. But it will be His Spirit at work in you. Proper motivation in Christ-centered preaching is, in essence, presenting the whole counsel of God. That, that's really what we're talking about. I hope you recognize this is not a new methodology. I'm really just talking about trying to present the message of Scripture. Commanding people to do what is right without explaining why or how inevitably hurts them. Because they are left to consider their works and abilities as the cause of God's acceptance or affection. As a result, well-intended instruction dispensed with the motive of helping people inevitably hurts them. On their own, no one can do what they are told they should do. <clears throat> Thus, if all they hear are the shoulds, you should do this, you should do this, they inevitably will face despair or pretend self-righteousness. The instruction meant to cure, therefore, ultimately wounds because unless God's redemptive truth characterizes the instruction, it will do nothing. Thus, it is the obligation of every Christian preacher to realize that bare, righteous instruction wounds. Do you know that? If all I've said to people in the sermon is, don't do that, that is a wounding message. I know as a fallen preacher, people cannot but do so if I only present the shoulds or the should nots without the message of grace, I have left people hopeless. Or, as Pharisees, believing they really, really did live up to those standards. While we may experience more of God's blessing and fellowship as a result of our obedience, we do not risk rejection by our failures. We may experience discipline as a result of our sin. But fatherly discipline, even when harsh, is still an expression of love for a child's welfare. As a child is healthier emotionally when there is never any question about his or her parents' unconditional love and favor, God's children are spiritually healthier when they are taught from the pulpit there is no question about their Heavenly Father's unconditional affection, perpetual favor. We are saved by grace alone. We are sanctified by grace alone. We are secured by grace alone. When you recognize that, then grace becomes motivation. How we present these proper motivations, we've already heard so much of this, I won't belabor it. We talk about a gratitude response to the love shown, love shown us by Christ. What I try to do is not make people flee the ogre in the sky. I try to encourage them to remember the depth of God's love in the person of His Son so that their obedience is an outflow of gratitude toward Him. You can read some of this, but maybe you haven't had exposure to the Heidelberg Catechism, number 86. It's just wonderful in terms of expressing, if there's grace, why do we have to obey? It says this, Since we are redeemed from our sin and its wretched consequences by grace through Christ without any merit of our own, why must we do good works? Because... 
Just as Christ has redeemed us with His blood, He also renews us through His Holy Spirit according to His own image. Here's the key. So that with our whole life, we may show ourselves grateful to God for His goodness and that He may be glorified through us. It is gratitude that becomes the primary pusher. Guilt may have a role, but guilt should drive us to the cross and gratitude should lead us from the cross. And Christian ministers make a mistake if they believe that their job is to beat people about the head and shoulders with guilt so that they will do more of God's work. They will not. They'll only protect themselves more. Even if it appears to be obedience. Biblical support, you see the verses. Titus 2.11 is interesting. It's the grace of God that teaches us to say no. It's the grace of God that does that. Uh, another response of the course, avoidance of the consequences of sin, revealed. God says he'll discipline sin. But when God disciplines, what is that? Even that is love. He only disciplines those he loves, the Bible says. You know. Love for others, love for love by God. If God loves us enough to warn us of the consequences of sin, if he has worked a work in us by which we are responding in gratitude to him, we want to not only please him, we want to love what he loves. And we want to love those whom he loves. And of course you see the passages that would confirm that. You see the essence. The rules don't change. I'm mostly concerned about motives. If we see the cross in all of Scripture, are we presenting Christ and his grace as the motivation for holiness? You have to understand, many preachers think the goal of good preaching is to make people feel guilty, just as many people believe it is their obligation to feel bad in order to merit grace. It is known as Protestant penance. I'm supposed to feel real bad, and that's what makes it right with God. If I've been real bad, I should feel bad or longer. That'll fix it. No, it won't. In essence, what we do is, is we're, we're undermining the grace of God. We, we said His death and resurrection were once for all sufficient. And now we say, no, you've got to feel real bad, and that's what makes it okay. Now, I'm not talking about being without conviction. But I am trying to say it's not our guilt or guilty feelings that are rectifying. And ultimately, those who are forgiven much, love much. And the joy of their salvation fills them. And part of the mark of a, a company of believers who understand grace and right obedience is that joy fills them and is reflected from them. And those who are beaten down and heavy laden and never can do enough for God because the preacher is arm twisting and pushing and making them feel bad may appear to be doing a lot of good work. But they're not before God. It's just feeding them. Who is it, after all, that wants that burden of guilt on your back as you try to serve God? Who's the accuser of the elect? It's Satan who wants that. It's Christ who wants the burden off so that you can rise up and lift your head and serve Him in newness of life. The bottom line of Christ centered preaching is that we're trying to take people away from themselves. We're trying to take them away from themselves as the agent of healing. I've got to do something to fix it. I, I go to Christ. I put myself in His hands. I rest in what He has done. In doing so, I hope we, and you can read more about this other times, we try to make sure people know, even in our preaching, how to plug into Christ's grace and power. We talk a great deal about sin in terms of having people turn to Christ in confession, claiming their sonship, we, we talk about the power of the Holy Spirit and therefore we turn them away from their own bootstraps and talk about the Holy Spirit's power and what God's Word provides and their own belief in the new creation. They are now posa non vacare, able not to sin by His Word, not by their Word. Have them believe deeply in that. What we're trying to do is preach Christ's redemptive work as the content within every passage which makes it the motivation behind every instruction. Taking people away from themselves to their only true hope and source of power to do what God requires. Francis Schaeffer expressed it this way. A lot of you know just his expression of the empty hands of faith, that when we come to God, we should come with empty hands, not claiming anything that we have done right before him. He also said that when we
we come to obey God, not just come to God, but seek to obey Him, he said we should learn to bow twice. He said we must first bow to the metaphysical truth. By that he meant what God has done for us. We have to bow to that first, to in humility say there's nothing I can do. It's what God has done for me that would make me right with Him. But before justification or after justification, I bow to the metaphysical truth of God's work in my behalf, humility before Him. And he said, you must bow first to that metaphysical truth before you would bow in obedience. Because if you just bow to doing the law, just do those works, just do those things, he says that bowing, though it seems right, is not just irrelevant, it's actually wrong. Because you're acting as though that's what makes you right with God. And you're not first bowed to the fact that it's His grace that makes you right with Him. What, what should we preach? Jesus. In all of Scripture, in all of our messages, we don't have another message. That is our message. The grace that is in Christ Jesus is our only hope in this life and the life to come. It is our salvation and our strength. It is our motivation and must be the counsel of God in all the messages that we preach for the glory of of His name. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, teach us of the grace that is in Christ Jesus, that we might proclaim Him and see others serve Him with the joy that is our strength. We pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen.